Hello and good morning, everyone. Good evening, depending on what time zone you are in. And um, welcome. Happy Wednesday to you all. So we'll go ahead and get started. And I want to welcome you to Persist Grand Rounds, an online series of lectures hosted by Persist, covering topics related to advanced EEG analysis for improving outcomes in both neurocritical care and epilepsy monitoring environments. My name is Marie Terrell, and I am the Director of Product Management with Persist, here to introduce our speakers, that's actually plural, and our topic for today's Persist Grand Round. So next slide, please. Brilliant. Through our customers, we understand the importance of investing in the EEG community through education, where expertise and knowledge can grow towards the utilization and implementation of EEG and quantitative EEG. The goal of Persist Grand Rounds is to provide a platform for those with clinical expertise, such as our speakers today, on topics of advanced EEG analysis as a way to connect with a broader community to share their expertise and knowledge so that we can all learn and grow together. Each online lecture features an experienced epileptologist or neurophysiologist presenting on a topic of their choice as it relates to EEG monitoring and analysis. You can visit www.persist.com slash grand rounds to keep up to date. Next slide. So this is our conflicts of interest statement. The opinions and viewpoints of each speaker are solely their own and do not represent Persist or any other commercial entity or commercial interest. Speakers are not required to include Persist, its software, products, or services. The content presented was not prepared or edited by Persist. Persist is not prov providing any form of compensation. Next slide. All right, so today is an exciting one. Um, for me in particular, I'm very interested to hear the talk today. We actually have two speakers, which is also a special treat. So the two speakers for today are Professor Stefano Siri and Brian E. Carr. There will be time for questions after the talk. So we expect the talk to be today between 45 and 60 minutes with a time for live Q&A afterwards. Um, you can write your questions in the Q&A box. Um, there should be a button at the bottom of your screen, and you can click there and type your question. It will be answered um, as best we can. We are also recording this webinar, and a copy of the recording will be made available to participants afterwards. So our two speakers today, first I will introduce Professor Stefano Siri, who is Emeritus Professor of Clinical Neurophysiology at Aston University and a consultant in clinical neurophysiology at Birmingham Children's Hospital in the UK, where he leads the epilepsy monitoring unit and the pre-surgical neurophysiological assessment of patients with drug-resistant epilepsy. His lifelong interest has been the development and application of analysis techniques of the scalp and intracranial EEG and of MEG signal in epilepsy and other neurological disorders, such as automatic detection of HFO. He is section editor of Brain Topography and associate editor of the epilepsy section of Frontiers in Neurology, and has authored over 150 publications. Our second speaker today is Bryony Carr. She works alongside Professor Stefano Siri. She is a clinical scientist and clinical neurophysiologist at Birmingham Women's and Children's in the UK. She did tell me, I was trying to get her to send me her bio sketch, and she said, oh, there's really not much to me, and I really beg to differ in the many meetings that I have had with uh, she and Professor Stefano Siri. So I very much look forward to both of their uh, talks today. So um, the talk today is titled Theoretical and Practical Considerations for Implementing EEG Electrical Source Imaging for the Assessment of Patients with Epilepsy. The learning objectives are, one, review physical and physiological underpinnings of source imaging of EEG MEG signal, EMSI, to critically evaluate evidence for the use of ESI in assessment of patients with epilepsy, and establishing pipelines for ESI, the availability of different toolboxes and software packages. And so, without further ado, I introduce to you Professor Stefano Siri and Brian E. Carr. Thank you very much. It's all you, Professor Siri. Uh, thank you, Marie. Thank you. And uh, 
thanks to the 93 so far participants that have joined us. Uh, I've seen some names that I feel quite ashamed of being presenting in front of, because some of them are long-term uh, friends, and they know that I'm a repented uh, uh, neurophysiologist in terms of EEG. I started with EEG, spent a ridiculous amount of time on MEG, and I'm back to EEG again towards the end of my career. So uh, that's my story, essentially. And uh, today, I'm Obviously, I don't want to and I don't aim to give you a systematic review in any form or shape. There's enormous amount of data out there. And I'm trying to just give you the perspective of our experience of setting up a service and uh, trying to use that uh, thread to actually go through some of the uh, background uh, uh, knowledge that uh, together we have implemented and developed here in a hospital setting. So if you're expecting some fancy science, you'll be disappointed. Um, um, the personal disclosure for both Brian and I is that we have no conflict of interest uh, uh, to disclose relative to this uh, uh, talk. And as a, any, uh, any presentation, you, know, you must have a plan. I think, I think I'm gonna stick to it. Uh, and uh, I'll start with some terminology, which is probably uh, too basic for most of you, but uh, it's always good to have some common language and then look at uh, why, uh, why are we doing what we're doing, given that uh, mostly what I'm going to talk about is non-ictal EEG uh, data analysis and, uh, and, and what is the evidence to use that, and then look at how we do it, um, touch base on some fundamentals of uh, what happens behind the scene in many of the software packages that are available and, uh, and look at case history as part of the evolution of the pipeline that I'm going to show you. So the terminology, just very quickly, for those of you and a few probably that uh, are maybe neurophysiologists but not worked in, uh, in epilepsy care or vice versa, uh, is that we are looking at mostly at characterizing uh, parameters that relate to what is called the, traditionally it's been called the irritative zone or, or the areas that is responsible for spikes. And it, we find them in interictal, in interictal recordings. We find them in outpatient activity, inpatient, LTM, et cetera, et cetera. The epileptogenic zone, which is another construct, another concept um, that is still widely, widely used, the area that generates the seizures is actually generally uh, probabilistically mostly accessible through ictal long-term recording. So you, you, you probably, unless you're extremely lucky, going to have to record the patient activity for a longer period of time. And, and in reviewing the data with the video recordings, obviously you try and make some assumptions on the basis of the physiology uh, of what are the areas of cortex that are responsible for the symptoms you see at the onset of an epileptic seizure. And uh, EMSI um, or ESI in this particular case uh, is electrical source imaging we'll be talking about. Um, I will talk about both low resolution and high resolution EEG um, as they're both, uh, they both uh, um, have a very, very promising potential to be helpful in the pre-surgical evaluation. And uh, obviously the other the other concept is that once we record interictal spikes during the traditional EEG, um, we, uh, we will try to map um, the areas of the brain that are responsible, or what we call the generators or the sources in physiological terms of the recorded spikes. Um, we'll come to that terminology later, the inverse problem um, or the inverse solution when we find one. And, um, and what it means uh, in terms of the physics and the um, software application. Um, so the interictal spikes are a very strange uh, family of phenomena that um, given that we, we rely so much on them, um, I just bring to the discussion the evidence to suggest that they have their useful proxy measures of the area that trigger seizures. Otherwise there's probably no point in spending all this time doing the analysis. And the evidence so far is, is obviously mixed because there's no real um, systematically performed study that looks at that. It's always mostly retrospective data analysis and uh, some mixture of uh, correlational studies with uh, intracranial data. And I'm 
quoting this particular paper from uh, Fabrice Bartolome in Marseille, who's looked at uh, enterocrine spikes in intracranial data, showing how they relate with the seizure onset zone. And uh, um, we believe, and we have evidence from the experimental data to suggest that whilst you require a sufficient pool of neurons that become for some reason or another hyper excitable during uh, in, in the minutes or the seconds or the days, in some cases preceding a seizure, um, they are temporary and spatially associated with the seizure. So there's some kind of relationship. And that relationship varies. Uh, spatially, um, in intracranial data, uh, most of the correlation at, uh, at sort of sub, um, sub centimeter level is uh, with uh, patients with focal cortical dysplasia. Patients who have malformation or cortical development tend to have uh, enterocranial spikes and uh, and uh, ictal onset zone as uh, as a very uh, very spatially confined. Uh, other etiologies of that relationship is a bit looser. And then uh, to throw, uh, I suppose, uh, another problem in the middle of all this, I'm just uh, showing you an old uh, review, but still very interesting to read for the few that haven't looked at it. Uh, by Marco De Cortis and Giuliana Vanzini, uh, uh, who have looked at uh, uh, the evidence that links experimental epilepsy with clinical epilepsy. And uh, they seem to discuss that in some cases there are hallmarks of impending seizures, but in some cases this is not the case. In fact, quite the opposite. If we look at ictal onset, sometimes we see interictal spikes disappearing prior to seizure onset. So are they uh, causally related or just purely spatially concordant, and um, and do we do we rely on increased spike density uh, to discuss uh, excitability, or the spike density represents increased cortical inhibition? Uh, more recently, I think uh, we have become to understand that not all spikes are equal, and we're starting to look at. Uh, another category of proxy measures or biomarkers, which, which we're not gonna discuss today, but it's the, what is called high frequency oscillations. These are uh, small, uh, very short lasting uh, bursts of uh, high frequency uh, EG activity in the region uh, between 80 and 500 uh, Hertz. Uh, they've been classified. I don't want to get too much into this, but, <clears throat> but to tell you that there's some evidence to suggest that those spikes that are associated as here in the in the slide with the presence of high frequency oscillations seem to be more representative of the seizure onset zone. So spikes are useful, but not all spikes are equal. Now spikes are like any any brain activity and uh, I hope I don't offend anyone by presenting something so basic, but uh, uh, in order to discuss how to go from electrical fields to sources, we need to, to do the inverse uh, walk, which was to, to explain how can um, something look uh, on the scalp the way it does. And, and in, in our field, obviously, we tend to discuss um, representation of that activity. We, that representation is usually a vector, or uh, we call them dipoles. And these dipoles are um, have an orientation, and that orientation is either radial, as I show up here, um, uh, or tangential, as it happens when your uh, your sources are all aligned along a, a sulcal um, gray matter, or oblique, when a combination of the two occurs. And we can use this construct, which are equivalent dipoles, to uh, to imagine that we have a large enough population of neurons, we're going to be able to record them from the scalp. Um, so current dipoles are obviously a construct. And in order for us to be recording something from the scalp, we need a, a good amount of pyramidal neurons, usually something in the region of a, a cubic inch or two cubic centimeters. Uh, there, there's something about EEG that, and, and MEG to an extent, to a, a good extent, that makes things a bit more complicated. It's the volume conduction. The fact that uh, by the time a source produces its output, uh, that output tends to be smeared and represented more widely on the scalp surface than the source would uh, probably suggest. And this is something we have to deal with in, uh, in, 
in the analysis when we are trying to reconstruct sources from, uh, from fields. Um, so a radial source would pretty much look like this on a scalp. Um, and the density of what we call the isocontour lines, pretty much like we, we look at the weather forecast, the denser they are, the more superficial the source will be. And this is a radial uh, source that has obviously an orientation um, that shows mostly, if not only, uh, one of the two polarities here. And uh, this would be uh, how a tangential source would look like, something that has a source on a, on a fissural part and shows a positive and a negative um, a field far away from the source. And, and if we want to put an educated guess just on the basis of the field, we imagine the source to be somewhere near the denser part of that uh, series of isocontour lines or where the voltage field tends to decline towards zero. Um, so what do we need to do this, um, uh, this source analysis? Well, we need to have the EG, of course. We need to uh, have electrode position, but that's not always a mandatory. We will see um, that this is the case. And then when we acquire the EG, uh, we will have to deal with some choices. Um, how to represent that EG? Uh, the choice of reference, uh, how to deal with a low signal to noise uh, ratio, relatively low signal to noise ratio uh, that uh, scalp EG has in some cases, and then when to analyze this transient in its uh, time course. Do we start, do we choose arbitrarily the peak? Do we choose arbitrarily the onset? Do we choose any time between the two? Or do we have metrics to choose whether in one case we need to and other cases we don't? And then, then we look at what happens behind the scenes, as I said, in, in some of these packages. So look at uh, acquire an MR of the patient or use a template brain uh, and then construct what is called the head model or how a source will lead. Uh, um, so what are the physical properties that lead a source to uh, represent uh, itself in, in fields on the scalp, calculate it, the transformation of that uh, to allow calculating what is called the forward model, and then uh, calculate the source model itself, or you know, be able to compute where the abnormalities are coming from. Um, I think a seminal paper that everybody shows these days. I uh, hope Christoph and uh, all the authors of this paper uh, are uh, fed up of looking at this picture. Um, has indicated very early on that uh, sampling or the number of electrodes you apply makes a big difference in how your sources will be seen by any uh, analysis uh, package and any, any inverse solution strategy. And I think the message is that um, the, uh, in general, the message is that your accuracy, let's put it that way, or your ability to have sources that are concordant with uh, the region where you somehow find out the seizures or the spikes are originating from, um, has a strange strange way of going about. Uh, if you have a dense EG uh, representation, you get obviously uh, some return into, uh, you know, from your investment. Uh, if you downsample your EG, you have to do it in a homogeneous way. So this is what the message is about. Uh, you can see spurious sources if you start putting dense electrode uh, packages in specific regions uh, and you behave a lot better if you use less electrodes but equally spaced. And I think that is the message that obviously has its own variability depending on uh, noise, depending on algorithms you choose, whether you use realistic models or spherical models and so forth. But the message I think is pretty strong and uh, clear in that sense. How much in real life is, a, is an issue that has been addressed uh, only to a certain extent. And usually, as, uh, as we know, it, it, it's happened mostly on retrospective data analysis, uh, because that's what most uh, clinical settings will allow you to do um, for ethical reasons in, in many cases. Uh, you can't really randomize patients to surgery or not surgery or, you know, so it's quite uh, or invasive versus non-invasive. 
Um, so what we have here is, um, uh, is one example of a paper that's looked at this issue of what happens to the source in real life when, uh, when you downsample. And, uh, and obviously, as expected, I think the more electrodes you have, uh, the better your accuracy will be in terms of spatial concordance. Um, however, uh, that's not the same in every patient. And you can see patient one in this case, uh, the error measure is, is a bit bigger than others. Uh, in some patients, it's almost negligible. Uh, on average, it's, it's sub-centimeter, the difference. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's a good message to imagine that um, in most cases, we use this in the context of a more global clinical evaluation, which includes imaging, which includes sometimes uh, uh, obviously, uh, PET, PET imaging or you know, and, and other modalities of, of assessment of the epileptogenic zone, um, and this is the average of the various uh, various patients. So you can you can see that you're looking at a centimeter um, lo uh, localization error versus something about just short of four millimeters. So that's uh, that's. The, I suppose a trade-off or the price to pay for not using high density recordings. Um, measurement of electro coordinates. So where are the electrodes on the scalp is more important for um, um, obviously if you're using realistic models, but, but uh, models that have to do with how the head is in that individual patient. But, um, but it introduces a very complex issue, which is uh, co-registration. And co-registration in, in, in our experience, in the experience of the people that have done metrics of it, is one of the most uh, crucial parts of, uh, uh, of the analysis that can introduce quite significant localization errors more than the ones that we associate with uh, electrode numbers. So it's a very, very key point. And, uh, and in many cases, uh, using uh, a template like here on the right uh, with coordinates uh, placed on a spherical, um, model is uh, is sufficient. Uh, we've touched base on the reference, and I'll just I could close it with this slide, and then say after at the end of the slide that uh, you're probably better off using what is called the average reference for a variety of reasons, not last because that's ultimately what any software package will use before it performs source analysis. However, the problem is very complex. It's uh, created. Uh, um, I suppose difficult relationships between scientists over the years, and it also produced a lot of papers for some. So I think in a way it's it's an issue that I don't want to dwell too much in, but but to acknowledge that the aim is to have non-ambiguous measurements that uh, measurements that don't vary um, over time in that particular individual, and uh, and how we do that, well we. If we re-reference uh, re uh, what we know from uh, time series analysis and from, from the analysis in the time domain is that uh, changing the reference will affect the polarity. So if you're into evoke potentials and you have uh, something that you call P100, you may be disappointed because that P may well become N if you use the uh, a, a specific reference with a specific value, given that it's just a, an algebraic subtraction. Um, uh, and it influences the amplitude at each channel. But for our specific purpose, which is look at topographic distribution of a signal or scalp maps, then uh, the, the reference, and, and in particular, obviously the average reference is not, uh, not, very, not very critical because you're actually subtracting an equal amount from all channels. And so you're effectively, this is an example of a study that uses a visual evoke potential as an example, because they produce waveforms that are pretty, uh, pretty known to all the neurophysiologists. And you can see that why as the waveforms change quite dramatically in amplitude and potentially in polarity, uh, like here, the maps remain pretty much the same. So the positive and negative peaks uh, or the area of highest uh, the maximum and minima will remain uh, in the same region. Uh, and that's, I think, the message is uh, uh, about this. Uh, there is obviously phys physical justification for that. 
we're assuming that the net sum of the uh, potentials that come out of the brain or currents that uh, exit the brain are is equivalent to the ones that enter the brain at any point in time. And, and therefore, if you're sampling the whole, uh, the whole volume, then uh, or the surface of the whole volume, then your net uh, will be zero. The other problem is SNR, uh, signal to noise ratio. Uh, now, SNR is, is obviously what you want to measure versus everything else that's in your EEG signal. And that could be physiological uh, noise, uh, could be uh, equipment noise, it could be just the uh, rhythmic activity. And uh, what you try and do is eliminate what is spurious. Um, there are ways to do that. We're not gonna to touch that because it opens a, a whole separate talk, I suppose. There are some practical ways of doing it, which is, uh, for example, independent component analysis. But what we tend to do is actually average uh, spikes that are homogeneous in their topography and in their uh, temporal uh, properties. Uh, averaging is a, it's a strange animal. The evoked potential world will tell you that given that the signal tends to be very low in evoked potentials as opposed to the noise, which is quite uh, high, then you need a lot of repetitions. You need a lot of trials before you get a decent SNR. Um, a paper that I've quoted here, which you may want to look at if you're interested, has looked at um, uh, in source space in this case, but uh, SNR of spikes in, uh, in, a, in epileptic patients looking more like four, uh, between one and four. Uh, so if you do this and you divide and you calculate log 10 times log base 10 of the ratio, you look at, uh, in some cases, a negative numbers. So your spikes are actually a very um, fortunate um, position to be in because the signal is quite high compared to the, uh, to the noise. And then we come to the point of, uh, I said, homogeneous. So um, how can anyone look at this and say, oh, that spike is the same as the other spike, or, you know, it's very difficult in the time domain looking at, uh, at EGs. So there are practical ways to do that. I'm just showing you examples. Uh, I'm not here to promote any approach. So uh, uh, I'm just showing you um, an example of one of uh, our spikes. Uh, in fact, it's one of the spikes in a paper really. So I try to show you uh, where they've looked at uh, uh, classifying spikes on the basis of homogeneity of their um, time and, and spatial domain uh, measures. And you look at your classes of spikes, you look at individual spikes and remove or, or, uh, or accept certain transits. Some may be marred by artifacts. See this one in particular, obviously we'll have five spikes that are sort of noisier because of the number, if anything. And so you don't have to do it manually, but if you want and you can, and you feel your, you know, your, your expertise uh, is, is well uh, spent in doing that, you can. Um, the performance is, is an issue of, you know, what does the man do or the machine can do that the man can't or vice versa. And uh, um, this is from a thesis, from a PhD thesis uh, of uh, a colleague from Utrecht. Um, they, they're looking at uh, what, uh, reviewing their, their data from the epilepsy monitoring unit, looking at uh, a particular provider of uh, spike sorting technology uh, and their clinical outputs. And you can see that uh, there, is a, there is a difference. The difference is not very high and obviously nobody would advocate to allow a machine to make clinical decision for you. So it's just a way to reduce workload because we are discussing something that if we have the ambition to make it available clinically more widely, it has to have some, uh, some pragmatic uh, you know, feasibility in a clinical setting. They went on, uh, this is another group in, uh, in, uh, in, in Holland uh, or in the Netherlands rather, that have looked at uh, uh, benchmarking on the same data set, different software packages. And you can see that there are differences, but uh, 
they can save all of these can save quite a significant amount of time and you know if you're familiar with one of them there's no reason to switch to another or vice versa just on the basis of a clinical report but but it's definitely what we're looking at is how do we move towards something that is clinically manageable and that would be one way with supervision of a of, a, of an expert the other point that i said i was going to deal with is when when during the spike at onset peak somewhere in between and why do that uh, is there any evidence to suggest that things should be different we were taught and I was having a conversation with my colleague the other day that seizure spread, the spikes shouldn't spread in theory. Well, uh, that is um, that's somehow challenged by evidence uh, that is recorded uh, intracranially showing that uh, spikes do seem to propagate, uh, to propagate at, at a distance following obviously the anisotropy or of, of the tissue. So they follow the white matter tracks most cases, or they follow local uh, local connections and these are two contributions by uh, the same group initially as a, a technical report and then as a more structured paper that you might want to have a look at so if they do spread then how do we how do we uh, parse uh, those components when do we do it and i've just used an example in a paper that i um, that I found interesting. Um, they advocate the use of principal component analysis, which is a way to decompose the variance into, uh, well, initially temporal uh, ICA and then spatial uh, PCA, sorry, uh, principal component analysis, and uh, look at then the back projection of the data into the space uh, domain and look at the time course. If you look at the time course, you can see that one spike has can the variance within you know this particular spike acquired a spike and, and wave acquired uh, from several electrodes. 73% um, of the variance is explained by this component, which has this time course, 24% explained by this component that seems to occur earlier. Um, and then the rest uh, is arbitrarily below 2% considered to be uh, noise. So in this particular case, you'd want to pick up the onset, the time here, here, and here. Uh, whereas if you look at other spikes, they don't seem to vary quite a lot. 99.2% of the variance is explained by the first component. So in a way you can do it, but you're not gonna find much. And we see that clinically quite frequently anyway. So the, the, this is the on, not the only metric that one can use, but it's a pretty, pretty simple one to use. And so, uh, the group in Geneva has uh, reviewed uh, the whole process of, um, in, in a very, very interesting paper, actually, uh, that everybody should read, um, where they've looked at um, the factors that are just highlighted, the effect of SNR, the effect of when, and obviously the spatial uh, the spatial accuracy and the spatial number of electrons. And what you find is obviously that um, when you look at spike onset uh, in average spikes, you can see that you may have um, a certain configuration that changes over time. And as the spike peak, you have an activation of the mesial temporal structures and more generally of the basal temporal and inferior temporal uh, gyrus and sulcus that, that are, uh, that's not present at the half rising point. Uh, so I think it's quite an interesting um, point to make. And this is obviously even more complex when you look at individual spikes in whom uh, the, um, the signal to noise obviously is important. And when you look at low SNR uh, spike onset, you're probably gonna have an enormous variability that becomes less as you look at uh, where the SNR is higher. Finally, the how we do the reconstruction of the source. So there are two terms that I've used uh, probably too early, but for those who are just getting an interest in this, but uh, uh, one is uh, what is called the forward problem, um, which is essentially having a known uh, source within the brain. Uh, what is the field that this source, when it becomes active, would produce or would generate? 
This obviously is influenced by a number of factors that have to do with the geometry, with the physical properties of the tissues, etc. And that's, that's actually possible to compute. Uh, and in fact, it needs to be computed if we want to calculate uh, the, the second step, which is what we're interested in. Known a certain field configuration, can we reconstruct where it's coming from uh, in a way that's not ambiguous, which is called the inverse problem. I am really not going to go into the details of how and why and the various methods, but just to say that this calculation uh, requires several steps. The most important ones are the creation of this head model, and then calculating the transformation between one and the other, or how do we uh, calculate the projection from the source to the potential measurements, and then the source model. Uh, as far as the uh, first element, um, we can use head models that model the head as a sphere. In fact, a, a nested series of spheres uh, or um, others that uh, model uh, the head as a realistic um, as realistic uh, reconstruction of the head using the MR, and, uh, and therefore uh, those are computationally more intensive. Um, but uh, you know we need the MRI of the individual to do that. Uh, the reason why this is complicated is because as the signal travels, it finds different tissue types that have different. Um, different conductivity profiles. And, and so that conductivity profile, which is incidentally the inverse of the resistivity that I, that I was mentioning earlier on, has to be somehow modeled or known. And uh, uh, reconstruction that use uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, realistic head models based on the MRI of the individuals are different. There are different families and they all have, they all have a, quite an intensive computational load for um, this is just to show you what could happen to your signal, what invariably happens as it travels through, so it finds different resistivity as it travels through the various, uh, the various layers. So it's something that has to be accounted for in that calculation. And once you've calculated your lead field, then you have to calculate that solution. Uh, that solution is non-unique um, and, and therefore, uh, you have to add some, some restrictions, some boundaries, uh, anatomical boundaries to that uh, restriction or physiological a priori knowledge. Um, and uh, and when, you, when you do that, then you can come up with, uh, with uh, hypotheses that are plausible. Um, there are two families of solutions. You will, I'm using terms that you'll find if you use one of these packages. Uh, or if you venture into uh, kind of open source uh, analysis uh, software, um, some are called parametric. Uh, so they estimate one or more dipole uh, that of, of which we don't know the location and the strength of the moment. And uh, unfortunately you have to have some a priori choices. So for an EP, an evoked potential is possible if you have a somewhat of sensory evoked potential you start looking at what describes best that particular phenomenon, which is well known to you. But in, in epilepsy, obviously, uh, we don't have um, as easy uh, a prediction of where those spikes are coming from. So that's a bit more challenging, uh, particularly for things that change over time. And uh, the family of solutions that are also widely used now are uh, called linear inverse solutions or non-parametric. You have an enormous number of names for them. They all belong to somehow to the family of the weighted minimum norm family um, with various names that have specific, uh, specific specificity, let's put it that way, in terms of how this is computed and, and behave uh, better in certain situations as opposed to others. Um, now, our pipeline is, is pretty, it's been constructed in-house using available open source software. And more recently, we have, uh, um, we have been offered the opportunity to test uh, uh, something that, is been, uh, that we came across in a publication uh, and looked like a very interesting opportunity to look at uh, how do we uh, uh, reduce our workload or is it, you know, is it something that you want to do? And so um, 
we're going, my, my colleague here is going to show you some a single case just to show you how you can do things and how things can vary. But we acquire the data during our long-term monitoring, either from the 25 channels or with some uh, lower temporal infratemporal coverage. Uh, bearing in mind that in, in kids, um, you know, there's quite a bit of muscle around those areas. So you, you have to be quite lucky and get them on a good, uh, on a good day. Um, or uh, on higher density EG, 64 to 128 channels, depending on the head size and the compliance of getting the head uh, set up. We invariably measure like, 3D electro coordinates with, uh, with us, our system. And um, we use systematically semi-automatic spike sorting uh, because that's something that we found reduces our inherent variability. Uh, it could be me, it could be my colleague, uh, uh, working on the data or any of the scientists that will start doing this process. So you can, you can see how you can introduce bias in it. And, uh, and we've uh, slowly become uh, comfortable with using a semi-automatic, obviously uh, we will review all the data every single time. And then we, we use Brainstorm, uh, which is a software uh, that uh, is open source, but I suppose you know, there are many other packages. I'll show you a little slide in a minute. And uh, we clean the EG from EOG and BCG through, um, uh, through using independent component analysis, and then we average the spikes by group. Um, and th this is essentially, how do we use it? Well, we use it mostly to uh, aid uh, decisions on uh, implantation strategy. We came to this through our uh, more extensive experience using MEG and uh, uh, our first paper that we published on the topic was many, many years ago when with London, uh, with King's College, we looked at um, MEG and the role, the potential role for MEG. And we saw that actually, that's probably the most promising part, the idea of guiding or helping supporting a decision on implantation strategy. And, um, and that's us here. Um, this, uh, I'm sure the slides will be made available of updated a little table that uh, Christoph Michel and others had created, just looking at what's still around things, you know, like small companies vary, die, are reborn, etc., uh, or new techniques uh, come about. Um, and so, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I put in when uh, some of these uh, are CE marked for clinical use. I don't have the ambition to know, I've only relied on what was available on their website. Uh, but I hope you find this useful in case you're starting to wonder where to go. Uh, the final slide on this is what's the evidence so far? Well, the evidence so far, like any, uh, any new technology, new technique, and I'm saying new, not because it's new. I mean, I, I've, I worked on this since I had uh, shorts, uh, you know, I was really uh, just a young postdoc in the 80s. So in itself, source localization has been around for a long time, but it is young in terms of its clinical application. And I think uh, the evidence is uh, retrospective. The data uh, in this very rigid, very restrictive uh, systematic review, only three studies made it uh, into the re review uh, using EG and a bit more using MEG. However, uh, that's because the selection criteria were very, very restricted. Um, uh, however, when you look at individual studies and you look at these numbers, so the concordant index, um, uh, when, when the study uh, survives this, uh, this scrutiny, uh, the numbers are quite interesting, quite exciting. So I think there is merit. There's merit in working in it, on it. Um, I don't know how long it'll take to have randomized control trials uh, that um, that uh, take all the boxes for a high level of evidence. But I think the anecdotal evidence from the many, many papers that many of, of, uh, of the people that I've mentioned and others have produced uh, is, is, quite, uh, is quite exciting and compelling. So I'll leave you with Bryony to go through this case example, and then we can, we can, we can uh, receive some questions if you have any. Hello, um, so I'm one of the scientists at Birmingham Children's Hospital. So as we said earlier, we're just going to go through a case example just to show how we've used this data and how we've implemented the pipeline 
um, within our long-term monitoring service here. Um, so the patient we're going to present, he's a 12-year-old boy, um, normal pregnancy and birth with no neonatal concerns, and no developmental concerns. Um, he first presented with visual problems in 2019, so not all that long ago, um, I went to his local um, ophthalmology um, team. Uh, he was advised to grow out of these episodes and they did regress for a little while and then they started to increase in frequency again and that's since April this year. Um, the episodes he describes, he gets episodic blurring of vision daily. Um, he's very good at describing them actually, he's a very good historian and he describes the feeling um, coming from the back of his eye and he gets a gradual loss in the peripheral vision and blurring of vision um, and they're quite short lasting, they last about 10 or 15 seconds, he retains awareness throughout them. Um, and he says there's no real trigger to them, although tiredness can sometimes um, contribute to them. Um, he's had Goldman visual fields. He's a very cooperative teenager, and that's confirmed a homonymous left inferior quadrantinopia. So I'm no radiologist, um, but you can see on the MRI here, you've got a low grade or you've got a neoplasm in the right occipital lobe. Um, radiologists have reported a differential between either a low grade glioma or a large atypical area of dysplasia um, that occupies the right medial occipital lobe um, but stretches into the calcarine sulcus and the, into the prior to occipital sulcus as well. Okay, so I was just gonna talk through just our process. So as um, Stefano said, we record our scalp data. So this is his scalp video telemetry data. Um, I'm assuming most of you have seen EGs before, but we've got the right hand side at the top, left hand side, and then some mid, uh, midline lines here, then ECG, EMG. And what you can see is this persistent spiking over the right occipital region. Um, you can see it in our, we have a bipolar montage here. You can see it over T6 to O2, and P4 to O2. And intermixed in that is you've got some diffuse slow wave activity. So signifying an area of underlying cortical dysfunction. Um, we did do um, a denser array EG recording and we did this prior to his video telemetry setup because we knew he had fairly frequent interictal activity from um, some history we'd already received. And again, you can see these spikes fairly frequently, a little bit harder to visualise on here, but you can see them over these occipital channels here and here. And apologies, we haven't cleaned up this data, so we didn't do the ICA and remove the eye movement artefacts in it. And before I go on to the next slide, because I am going to show one of the patient seizures just um, to get an idea of what they look at. Can I just ask that people don't take photos or record the next slide just because we have got the patient visible on camera on it. So we, um, so as um, Stefano was saying, um, when you get capturing this data it's hard to decide whether these spikes are all part of the same group or not so we we run this um run our data through persist um uh, and we manage we make these voltage maps here so we did this on both his 64 channel denser aeg recording and also his 27 video telemetry channel recording um and these uh, this voltage map showed um maximum negativity so ours is the opposite way around to most papers where it's shown in blue so our maximum negativity is shown in red here. And you can see at that over the right posterior quadrants on both 64 channel and the 77 channel. Um, it looks like an oblique dipole, so a combination of a radial and tangent, tangential um, dipoles. Um, we can assume that the source is somewhere underlying in that right posterior quadrant. And you can see they're quite similar between the two different spatial um, sampling uh, things that we use. Um, so what we then do, um, we create a 3D model of the patient's brain, which is what we've done from this patient's MRI using free surface software. And we import that into Brainstorm. Um, and what we've done is we've done that for both the 64 channel recording and the 27 channel recording. Um, just to have a look and see whether there's any difference in the sources that we are, um, we are recording. So again, I've just got a video and it's a video that goes through this spike here. So we've got an average spike. I think this is around about 90 spikes that we had um, to average from here. Um, and you can see you've got quite a nice defined spike here. So if I press play on this, you can see from the onset of that spike, you can see this source here and you can see it more on the superior aspect of that, the um, right occipital lobe and it stays around that area. Um, this big hole here corresponds to where that tumour is or the, the neoplasm. If we did the same for the 27 channel, you get a similar kind of picture. 
but it's slightly on the more inferior aspects of that border, probably due to the spatial sampling, but you can see it's in relatively the same area. Okay. What we can then do, and we have done in the past, is we, um, we can specify areas of interest on these 3D models. So we can assign scouts um, to these models um, and delineate exactly what areas of the brain are involved in the generators from those, those spikes. Um, we've, we've recently uh, had the pleasure of sampling some of the, the SIS DSI powered by Epilogue, and we've um, sent in our data sets to that, which has taken away a huge amount of work that we end up having to do when we, we process all of this data through Brainstorm. Um, and they generate these really nice images. And this is the big takeaway from this, in that we take this information to um, uh, our epilepsy surgery MDTs. And these images are really good to show the neurosurgeons and neurologists there because they, they like being able to see this data um, superimposed on the MRIs. Um, and again, we sent in the 64 channel data and the 27 channel data. Um, this is from the peak of the spike for each of them. I'll just point that out because we haven't got the half rising or the onset here. And you can see they're actually really similar. Um, and with the lower spatial sampling, the 27 channel is actually quite similar to 64 channel there. Um, when we compare that to what we can do on Brainstorm, so we can do a similar kind of thing, it, it compares quite nicely. Um, so we've got the half rising and the peak here. So this is for the 64 channel data and it, we've um, projected, we've done the cortical projections with that source data. Um, and you can see that here for the half rising, sorry, and here for the peak. Um, and that's very similar to what um, we were able to get through the epilogue software. When we look at the 27, uh, 27 channel data, again, it's much the same. It compares quite nicely. You can see these cortical projections here, um, which correspond quite well to what we were also getting from the epilogue data. Okay, I'll, I'll pass this back to our summary. <laughs> okay, I think we're done. Uh, thank you for the patience. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of slides, but uh, I hope you found it of some interest. Uh, I mean, the whole idea was to share with you uh, the, the very practical aspects of it. So a pipeline that we developed uh, using uh, open access source uh, software and, uh, and actually trying to look at uh, how we can transfer this into a more routine service, which is obviously under a lot of pressure uh, in any clinical setting and what areas can we uh, benefit from some level of uh, uh, pre-processing and, and data reduction techniques. And uh, I've shown you some examples and Brian has shown you a clinical case uh, that uh, can show you how that takes uh, form in real life. Uh, I think the, the literature on this uh, moving at the third point is that uh, it's early days, but uh, if we look at uh, the enormous amount of anecdotal, uh, I wouldn't say anecdotal, but the not, not controlled or not um, uh, sometimes not meeting all the requirements for uh, the highest level of evidence available. Um, all the studies that have been done and the work that all of our community has done to actually contribute to electromagnetic source imaging. I think there's really uh, something there and there's definitely the need for uh, large collaborative studies that would address this uh, last point that needs to be addressed. But wherever you look at the data, uh, which is mostly retrospective, there's, there's strong evidence to suggest that, uh, that, that there, is, uh, there, is, uh, there would be a good investment. And uh, uh, I know we came out of COVID having made all the wrong choices. For example, in the UK, we were prevented from using masks because there was no evidence that it would be effective. And then, um, then we learn through a, a review in, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine that uh, actually, in fact, sorry, that was the proceeding of the National Academy of Science, that actually anything you put on your face uh, works better than nothing. So lack of evidence is not necessarily evidence of lack of e efficacy. So I, I'm just warning everyone that, you know, there is, uh, there's something in between uh, and, and we need to use uh, uh, our judgment, our clinical judgment, which is ultimately what we are accountable to. And thank you for your patience. Fantastic.
Thank you to you both. That was a, a great talk. Um, very informational. Thank you very much. We'll move straight to the Q&A. So we have a few questions coming in. Um, I'll just uh, go in the order that they were asked. So the first question is from Dr. Fisher. Um, isn't where electrodes are, so below the, below the hairline, for example, as important as the number, especially for temporal sources? Uh, Professor Sarah, you are muted. <laughs> Always muted. Three years of uh, COVID and uh, and uh, yeah, virtual meetings, and I'm still doing that. Sorry. Um, yes, the answer is yes. It is important. Uh, it is important to. I mean. I, I put the extreme case of the average reference where sampling the southern hemisphere of the of the volume conductor is uh, is um, has a role, uh, and obviously sampling uh, the uh, basal temporal regions is also very important. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are some papers again that uh, that have been published. Uh, uh, relatively recently by uh, Sander Benitsky and, and uh, uh, other colleagues of the same kind of uh, consortia that have looked at um, how does the uh, 19 plus six electrodes, the three uh, infratemporal electrodes um, of, the, uh, of the montage that we traditionally use uh, behaving when, when compared to denser AEG. And actually the difference is very small, same with us. We sample the, the basal temporal regions because that's, uh, and it's, it's obviously a lot more important for, for your adult patients uh, pathology mostly uh, and for the temporal cases, but, but it is uh, something that gives you that homogeneity of sampling that I showed you in, uh, in, in the paper by Christoph Michel and others, and yet the ability to record on those electrodes where sometimes the very small rhythmic discharges or those spikes are coming from. So yeah, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I believe it, uh, it's the EEG, the 1020 with the additional subtemporal chain was is the official recommendation of the IFCN. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, there's that piece too. Um, okay, great, thank you. The next question, actually there were two questions about ESI versus MSI or MEG. So, uh, Dr. Spinelli says, from your personal experience, could you make a comment on MSI versus ESI in terms of clinical use? And Dr. Fisher says, is ESI as good um, as MEG? Um, so uh, I think I've declared my uh, pseudo conflict that I've worked for 25 years on MEG. And so, um, uh, I think I worked on MEG because I had one. Uh, so I didn't have to spend 1.5 million to put in my lab. Uh, and so um, I was very happy with what we did. Um, the, the, there is no real comparison study uh, of the level of evidence that you would want. But uh, if people are asking my ex experience after 20 years and, and what is available uh, in the literature, the difference is modest. Uh, it, it's uh, it's very modest, and it is very specific to uh, specific um, sensitivities of the magnetic uh, system, the, ma the magnetoencephalography array, and the profile of the gradiometers versus magnetometers or combination that you use. Um, uh, the traditional uh, knowledge is that. Um, MEG is a lot more sensitive to the uh, to the tangential sources. Um, uh, the EEG, uh, well, it's sensitive to both, um, and uh, but you have that added benefit of pure radio, which is very rare, to be honest, because most of the surface of uh, the convolutions of the brain are actually somehow uh, obliques or tangential. But um, but I think I think uh, it, it's difficult to give an answer. You know, would you spend 1.5 million or maybe 150,000? Uh, does the difference justify the investment? Um, I think there is a modest gain in some cases. The ideal that we found and, and people have published is that uh, in some cases, having both of them simultaneously recording give you that edge, that ability to capture the subtle differences of the two sensitivity profiles of the two technologies. And I hope I haven't tried to break even and, and you know, make everybody happy. But I think 
I think we're extremely happy. I'm, I'm a repented uh, EG person uh, after 20 years of MEG and so and more. Uh, however, uh, I don't find that what we do today is, uh, we do a lot of MEG as well, don't, don't get me wrong. We do about 150 MEGs a year in pre-surgical assessment of patients with epilepsy in, in our center. So um, I think, uh, yeah, I think we're, uh, the cost difference if you're asking is, is still too large. And I hopefully, uh, and I'm not campaigning for MEG to take over, but hopefully with the OPMs and the optically pumped magnetometers, um, the cost might come down uh, and, uh, and things might get a little bit more manageable cost-wise. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I just recently heard about that new type of MEG. I already forgot what it's called, the ophthalmologic something. Oh, OPM. Uh, OPM, yeah. Opti yeah. Optically pumped magnetometers. Yeah, yeah, that'll be interesting to follow how that goes. Okay, we have a question from Dr. Novotny. Are there studies identifying the sensitivity and specificity of ESI and in lesional versus non-lesional cases or different underlying pathology? Um, so, um, again, um, it depends how, how restrictive your criteria are. If you're looking at, uh, are there any at all? Yes, there are. There are studies that have shown that um, like, like uh, I suppose, like other techniques uh, that investigate brain uh, brain function, uh, your focal cortical dysplasias will behave a lot better, um, possibly because of, uh, of the, the SNR of the, of the spike discharges, possibly uh, because of the uh, particular configuration of the fields that uh, that are uh, created by this abnormality. Um, and, and obviously the neocortical cases are, um, are probably a better result uh, in our experience, at least. Uh, I'm biased because we see only not to 18 year old. And, and so that is proportionately um, has a higher representation in our, in our group, the dysplasia. Uh, we, we picked a tumor just to give you the most, uh, the most uh, unfortunate situation where you have uh, uh, quite an extensive lesion um, that uh, that has uh, a lot of potential uh, areas uh, you know, in the border of that resection of, of that lesion that uh, that could generate the spikes. But but yes, the pathology the, the evidence is there, and it suggests that uh, your dysplasias will behave better than, for example, infarcts or or other conditions. Mm -hmm. Possibly also, it, it, a lot of it depends on on your modeling whether you know we when we extract the with free surfer the uh, the head model the, the model of the head that you've seen obviously we we mask the lesion so in a way you know, it depends how much pre-processing of your image is, is done how that is it taken into account into constructing your forward model and so forth so the variability is quite large but if, if you take all the papers that are out, I think I've, I've made a reasonable summary of the evidence available so far. Mm -hmm. It's intuitive that lesional cases would uh, maybe produce better results with ESI. Would you also say though, at the same time, that it may be particularly important for the non-lesional cases because they're so difficult? I think it depends what we mean by non-lesional. Uh, I think we're talking about MR negative, I suspect. Yes. Yeah. And uh, MR negatives, uh, is, is that there's overwhelming evidence uh, from, uh, uh, from the wide distribution that uh, SCG has now uh, gained across the world from being a pure French uh, kind of uh, almost... Uh, vice uh, you know to something that's used worldwide and we learned that actually you know you put your electrode in that area and then you see these typical continuous spike and wave uh, of the fcd type 2 or taylor type or so um, so i think yeah non-lesional as in mr negatives mm -hmm. are in most cases not non-lesional mm -hmm. and and so it's it's how good we are and in that sense uh, converging evidence uh, yeah, we only had an hour, we used more than one hour. So I apologize for that. But I think 
you know, when you start looking at merging different imaging techniques, you start, we had a case done recently that, that you know, after reviewing and reviewing, we finally found a PET hypometabolism that had been neglected in the past. And then we put electrodes in. Uh, I wish we had, um, uh, because it was supposed to be an insular cases, actually, it, we didn't, we didn't decide not to do a source analysis, actually. Mm. Um, it, it, you know, if, if you, if you study hard enough and you, you know, you will find converging evidence, I think. And, and so um, I suspect that hitting the jackpot on a tiny little focal dysplasia, maybe a bottom sulcus cortical dysplasia, uh, using any technique is, is very difficult. That's probably why the numbers are not favorable for, for those kind of MR negative cases. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so there was a comment that um, there's interest to hear from you at some point in the future, any experience that you have with um, ICTL ESI, the localization of seizure epics. And then also there is a comment. Um, could you also comment on ESI of EEG rhythms without spikes, like slowing and paroxysmal fast activity? Um, I, I can. Uh, so uh, the, the, ICTL, um, the ICTL cases, I think uh, we, we are, we don't have a vast experience. Uh, I don't know how many people have a vast experience. Uh, I think you probably have a selection bias when you start doing that because uh, uh, many of the sudden hypermotor events, you don't really have the luxury uh, of having metrics to choose when prior to the seizure onset to go for and what to go for. Uh, usually you're looking at fast discharges maybe. Um, the SNR is pretty low. I know there are papers and, and maybe some of the writers of these papers are in the audience. I've seen certainly some uh, very prominent colleagues in there. So um, I, I think it's doable. I just, I don't have direct experience in it. And I would, I would want to be persuaded as to, you know, what metric to, to, to use and how consistently we could uh, choose where to do it and how. Um, um, I think, I think that, the non uh, uh, the non spiky EGs is a big problem. We've published recently a paper uh, looking at measures of entropy on MEG data, um, and uh, we can actually get from uh, uh, from the EG and MEG data uh, metrics that is very promising in terms of extracting uh, from uh, uh, from the EG data some uh, some evidence of local abnormality. I think the spatial resolution will be limited. Um, I, I know the papers that have looked at uh, spike activated fMRI with no spikes, for example, um, which is uh, an interesting similarity in a way uh, where you're you know, challenged with extracting uh, from the EG something is not overtly visible. And, and uh, so whether you do uh, like uh, the authors did uh, using microstates or using you know, segmentation, using independent component analysis or something where you can data reduce and then perform uh, source analysis on the data. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting area that needs uh, a lot of work still. Mm -hmm. um, someone pointed out that uh, Curry was not in the list of the programs. Was that just uh, a... Okay, oh, I hope I don't get I hope I don't get fined <laughs> for that. It was in it was in one of the iterations. I don't know why I missed it, and yeah. I apologize if there's anyone uh, in Curry. I will edit the slide. I had it <laughs> because I just took uh, Christoph Mikkel's slide and made it more updated, but uh, yeah. that did not imply that Curry is not existent anymore. In fact, it's very widely used. Uh, in many surgical programs, I know, you know, for example, the Cleveland Clinic is, uses systematically in their pipeline. So my apologies to those that use um, that use Curry, or uh, if there's anyone from Curry uh, from uh, from uh, obviously. I haven't seen tribute. any names. I, I apologize possible. profusely. Uh, it's an <laughs> site that I will correct in the final version of the slides. <laughs> Thank you. So. Those are all of the questions, but I actually have a question for you. And this is from my experience in having discussions with a lot of our users regarding uh, ESI in general. 
So there's lots of experts on this call, as you pointed out, lots of people who have been in the research field of ESI and have seen it transition now over into the clinical uh, application, which you pointed out, the clinical application of ESI is still in its infancy. So there's lots, there's plenty of folks on the talk that are experts. I also know there's lots of people here in attendance who are beginning and considering implementing this into a, a clinical practice. At the moment in the field, there are not agreed upon standards for picking spikes or assessing SNR or even how to do a clinical interpretation of an ESI result. So I wonder, so, so just for that last piece, for example, you know, the neurologist, I think, can be rather easily educated in terms of, you know, what the results mean from a technical standpoint. The difficulty is then to communicate to their surgical team what the results mean from a clinical perspective. How should we incorporate this into the, the planning discussions and how should, we, how should we talk about it? How should we reference it? So do you have any recommendations, I guess, on those two pieces, picking spikes and assessing SNR and then how to incorporate the results into a, a surgical program? Do you have recommendations for any of the beginners that are on the call or those considering implementing this into their practice? Um, thank you for the last difficult question. Yeah, sorry to hit you with that right at the end. <laughs> I, I think, so our pipeline, uh, and I say our, not because we have any, any copyright on it, but just to say the one that we've adopted is, uh, is actually the, the result of trying to extract from the vast amount of uh, of confound and, uh, uh, and I suppose boundaries in which you have to move to uh, optimize your, uh, your analysis strategy uh, based on, on evidence and the literature. And so whilst you're correct in saying that there's no prescriptive way of doing it, I think uh, what I'm proposing is nowhere uh, too far away from what most experts in, in our field would advocate. Uh, would advocate um, you know, using as many electrodes with an equal sampling as you can, but if you cannot or you don't, you're, not, you're just exploring it, then I think the, the IFCN recommendations are uh, very robust and actually in our experience, very valid. Uh, you're, if you're prepared to accept a seven, five, six, seven millimeter inaccuracy uh, before you go to 64, 128 in, in most cases. Um, so that's for the for each one of the points that I that I covered. Uh, the evidence is is, is quite clear that uh, there, there is there is some level, some degree of topographic changes over the course of a spike. So I think mm -hmm. the recommendation of picking, if you don't do PCA, if you don't do statistical analysis of the variance of your spike, uh, or you can't, you don't want to, or uh, I think the the half rise is a, now an established time point in which all of us will go and look. That's from work from Margita Zaik and her lab and the people in Geneva, but now adopted uh, more widely. Um, so, uh, so I think that to me is, uh, you know, is, is a, uh, a reductionist approach that works. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and then when you look at using uh, sort of, the real head of the patient. Most patients that undergo pre-surgical assessment will have a high quality, good T1 volume or, or uh, good white gray matter contrast uh, scan. So it's quite easy to use it. You don't necessarily need accurate electrode positions, although if you can, you're in a better situation than if you don't. Uh, but it's still within very much the kind of variability that I've discussed earlier. And then ultimately, the methods. This is not a methods talk. There are people that are more qualified than I am uh, in talking about the physics of it. But but certainly, uh, most people will say that one of the linear um, uh, inverse solutions, or you know, the, the distributed sorry inverse solutions, so a weighted minimum norm, S Loretta, uh, Epifocus. So the the various uh, evolutions of uh, the common concept. Um, give pretty much consistent results. Bryce uh, not left the building, but she's left this <laughs> camera. And, uh, she can vouch for for the fact that uh, uh, you know I asked her to look at all of them, and initially 
you know, but, but now she was realizing actually that it, there isn't such a great variability in, 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 in those. Uh, so uh, in, in most cases, uh, you can't generalize, of course, but, uh, but that's, uh, so I think, I think there are some points that, you know, yeah. people who start have, um, have a good reason to start from. Yeah. And everybody needs to, you know, I feel that I wanted, I wanted us to waste our life uh, trying to do it ourselves before yeah. we uh, accepted your invite to try on 10 patients, the, uh, the ESI, uh, persist ESI. And, uh, and we were quite impressed with the fact that, you know, maybe uh, sometimes we look at each other and say, do we really want to do all of that? Or, you know, <laughs> however, you know, uh, it's, uh, it, it's what, uh, what people want to do. I, I don't think there's really any, I can't recommend any solution at all. Yeah. And obviously there are other, uh, we've spoken about curry, but there's many other uh, yeah. free, uh, I've, I've divided also in ones that have an, a, a GUI or not, you know, having a graphical user interface is a big deal for many of us. You know, you don't really want to start coding in Python to get something done in your right. life. Uh, uh, some do, but yeah, most of yeah. us nerds like to do it, but not, not many others. And what about the discussions that you have with your surgical team? How do you how do you yourselves communicate and talk with your surgical team about the results? I think we have a typical situation of a surgeon who doesn't believe anything you can't touch. So, uh, <laughs> right. so I don't think we're anywhere different from any other uh, person. But I think uh, you know I I try to I, I try to the, the first the, the first uh, obviously criticism is, oh yeah, but you have to faff around and you have to choose this, choose that. And I use the analogy with MR. A lot of us believe that the MRI is actually the patient's brain, but it isn't, you know, it's not the patient's brain. It's what you want to believe is a patient's brain. And when you have a tumor and you have a large area of edema and you see it in T1, it's a different picture from when you use a flare or when you use a fat suppression or, um, and, and that it's the same story, essentially. You're optimizing your choices of parameters to uh, try to answer a question. Mm. Um, it, it didn't go down very well, but I think, uh, I think I feel obliged. I gave a talk to the uh, International Society of uh, Neurosurgery, um, and, um, and I think, you know, I showed them images. I showed them that what they're seeing is a representation of the case space. You know, when you look at an MRI, you don't really see the tissue. Yeah. You think it's tissue, but it isn't. And, and uh, you know, so uh, with time, I think, and working together and the successes uh, and the hard work of our scientists, of course, um, I, I think you gain, you know, you gain trust. You gain mm. trust uh, by working together. I think it's as simple as that. They don't believe when you report an EEG, uh, the neurosurgeon thinks they can report it better than you can. You know, usually it's oh, I, even I can see that. That's what I get from our neurosurgeon. But I think okay, I'm 65 now, and I've wasted all my life uh, doing something that someone can do better than me with no training. Um, however, it doesn't matter really. You know, it's a journey that you take together, and I think we're we've moved quite a bit forward. I think I'm looking at Bry, hoping that she feels the same, um, and I think it's. Uh, it's a journey that you first have to want to do uh, as an individual team in neurology and neurophysiology, depending on how your, you know, your hospital is configured. And then, you know, you have to start discussing your results and then, you know, you start bringing confidence, you start giving options, mm -hmm. uh, particularly now in the days of stereo EG and non-contiguous sampling, non-contiguous cortex it makes a big difference to have some a priori hypotheses. And some yeah, hypotheses yeah. are, you know, to the neurosurgeon's view, even looser, a seizure semiology, you know, uh, how woolly is that compared to an EEG image? Right. You know? So um, I think, I don't want to underplay it, but I think it is a journey. Yes, and, uh, I agree with you. So, so uh, one last, Point, and then we'll wrap up since I know that we're 20 after the hour. Uh, we still have 75 people on the line though, so folks are uh, fairly interested. Um, <laughs> so the last comment is actually uh, quite helpful. Uh, Ming Lai says, Marie, to put your question another way, should there be a minimum standard one should propose for competency in the use of these tools? Uh, competency, did I hear correctly? Yes, yeah. competency. So, so minimum uh, training, for example. Okay, so now, um, so uh, I'm using now something 
that comes from the MEG world. You know, the American MEG Society has uh, tried to do some work and has done some work to try and indicate uh, prescriptively what is uh, the minimum requirement. Mm -hmm. And it's a work that our community has somehow implicitly uh, assumed because neurophysiologists should know all of this. Yeah. And I think in a way I can see where they're coming from and I, I don't disagree. However, you know, uh, neurophysiology is practiced by a lot of different professionals in, in epilepsy care. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't suggest that you get a, a non-neurophysiologist to go out and do some complex visual evoke potentials or something like that. But right. in epilepsy, um, I think there might be space either for a joint effort by the two societies, the uh, obviously the uh, International League and the IFCN to, uh, to look into that. There are uh, recommendations for electro positionings. There are individual recommendations, but there's no, as far as I know yet, uh, no standard uh, to say what is required. You know, the Americans are always a lot more uh, proactive in this. You know, they, they had standards for LTM uh, many, 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 many years ago in the uh, Journal of Clinical Neurophysiology um, and before any of us felt the need to actually uh, adopt them here, it's possibly because of uh, reasons that have to do with how the practice is uh, evolves mm -hmm. in, in the US. Mm -hmm. So uh, so yes, I think, I think uh, what I've shown you is uh, reflects the available knowledge that I could have access to mm -hmm. and our experience. However, I think having a framework that is accepted by uh, world leaders is always uh, reassuring for someone who wants to start. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, that's it. Those are all the questions that were in the Q&A. So I think we'll, we'll stop here and give you a break. <laughs> I've interrogated you for long enough. Um, thank you very much. Thanks to both of you. Bryony, thanks to you as well uh, for you, your time Diane. today. Yeah, this was well, very informative. I hope the participants didn't stay because they were laughing at me and found it too funny <laughs> to leave. Uh, but, <laughs> I'm sure not. There are many thanks in the Q&A as well. Um, thanks for your talk and appreciation uh, also for the accessibility of your talk. So there you go. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Thank I think it was very appreciated. So there will be a recording of this made available. Um, and yeah, so that's it for now. And thanks again to you both very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Right. Bye. 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 Bye.